So good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned earlier, I am principal counselling psychologist in St. Luke's Hospital. Um, and my main role in the hospital is a clinical role. I provide assessment and therapy for patients going through cancer treatment during and post treatment. And I'm also I have an educational role involved with providing psychological education to staff, as well as linked with various universities. And I also do uh, research. So this morning I'm going to speak about um, a particular research that we took on in the psycho oncology department. And I want to um, also acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Nicola Elmer and Dr. Kleena Donovan, who was involved in this uh, research project. Um, so this was something that we decided to kind of take on ourselves um, because during kind of COVID we could hear the impact on staff. Um, we have a bit of an open door policy within the psychology and psycho-oncology department here in Luke's whereby staff do come in to us if they're distressed. Um, and we were hearing a lot, a real lot of you know, impact. We, we were providing uh, psychological support like various other uh, general hospitals um, around Ireland. Um, and there had been a larger study taking place on kind of a, a quantitative approach, but we, we really wanted to capture the, the kind of felt and ex kind of nuanced experience of staff in a cancer setting. Um, and we felt actually it was really important to uh, kind of look at the impact on clinical and non-clinical staff. Um, I think we, we're quite a small hospital and non-clinical staff are also very much impacted generally by, by patient stories and in particular um, during the COVID. So, this talk is uh, going to look at the why, and I've kind of touched on that a little bit. We're going to speak, uh, I'm going to speak about the aims and the purpose. I'll, I'll look at the methodology of how we approach this piece of research, the findings, the challenges of doing this research, and maybe research in general um, within the HSE and kind of looking at dissemination. So the why, I, 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 as I mentioned, you know, we wanted to really capture the first-hand experience of seeing the impact on staff, um, both clinical and non-clinical staff. Um, and you know, a lot of the research states that frontline staff in direct contact with COVID-19 patients experience greatest levels of distress and anxiety. And we know that the risk to mental health of hospital staff um, was really, really kind of identified. Um, and uh, that's perhaps obvious in one sense. Um, but there was a kind of a limited kind of research out there, or actually no research out there, on the impact of COVID-19 on those working in cancer care, on staff working on cancer care. Um, and, we, and we just, we really wanted to hear from patients' own perspective. Um, and we thought a qualitative approach would be the, the approach, the methodology that we would use to capture that. Um, so as I mentioned, the aim and the purpose is to, to really kind of identify a rich understanding of the ongoing impact of working in cancer care alongside the pandemic and in doing so to gain insight into the needs staff and service provision. Um, and although you know the interviews we interviewed staff um, and when we heard their experiences and but it should note that this wasn't kind of a list of what should be done and what shouldn't be done although at times these things were highlighted but that wasn't the aim it was kind of a more how is this experience for you you know a very general piece where where staff members would take it themselves wherever they wanted to go with, with that particular question so um, I put out an email probably April last year to 2021, and I asked across the network, we have um, St. Luke's Hospital in Rathgar, and we have a centre in Bowman Hospital and a St. Luke's centre in, in James's. So I put out an email across the three sites to see who would like to be involved. And we just needed 10 members of staff. Um, and we got a really lovely range of disciplines from medics, nursing, uh, radiation therapists, physics, allied health and patient services and catering. Um, so patient uh, participants were interviewed 
uh, by myself and it was kind of a semi-structured open open-ended kind of interview um, and they were typically an hour long and the interviews were transcribed by uh, my two psychology um, colleagues and everything was kept anonymous and all names were changed um, and so I'll give, just give you a bit of a flavour of the interview questions um, I'll just read a couple. I won't have time to go through everything. So I just said, started off with, I'm interested in hearing what the experience of working during COVID-19 pandemic is for you. Perhaps you can begin by telling me what it was like from the beginning of the pandemic during the first wave. And does that differ to the second and, and where we are now? So a lot of the questions were like, what was that experience like for you? Um, and on reflection, what was that like? Um, and people really, participants really, really engaged and they were really, really open and I just really had to commend their, their honesty. Um, I mentioned kind of a qualitative approach, so we felt that we, we wanted to use and the, the one, the approach we used was IPA, inter, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis. Um, we thought this was a rigorous methodology and it kind of, so it involves extracting key themes and insights through multiple close readings of the transcribed tra um, transcripts and identifying related themes and sub themes emerging across all 10 interviews. The analysis was written up into kind of a narrative account and the themes were expanded. So as I mentioned, each of the quotes, they were, there was uh, anonymized and different names were put for each of the quotes. Uh, and the, the results and analysis were completed by one psychologist and checked and validated by a second. And um, so these were the findings. And we had six subordinate themes and then there were sub themes. So the main themes were work changes, human connection, fear, management, impact of COVID and personal reflections. And then there were sub themes for each of those. So I'm going to go through a lot of the findings now and they're in quotes. I won't go through each of the quotes because you can, if you can scan through them, you can read them yourself or this webinar will be um, uploaded uh, in the near future. Um, and I think the quotes themselves kind of speak, they, they, they tell you everything. So the first theme is work changes. And so Claire said, in terms of the suddenness, she said, it was just trying to scramble, but the kids were in school. But literally when the bombshell hit, that was Thursday the 12th. I think um, it was just, what are we going to do? We have no childcare, schools were closed. I have to be in work. My husband is a healthcare worker, has to be in work. It was just like, whoa. And so I've, I've got to mention there, I, I also, all the transcripts are forbidden. So the ums and the uhs are all there because that's part, that's part of the findings. And so you can see the suddenness was just, especially for those where there was two healthcare workers in the family. And another sub theme was the work change benefits. So I'm working from home for about three months and it's grand. I'm happy now. I can get my work done easily from home as I can in the office. I can, I'm actually working more efficiently. So it's interesting that for some, there were some benefits. And there was kind of commonalities with other disciplines and work colleagues. People want to help, they want to work they want to get the work done just by necessity of having to contribute in different ways. So the second kind of subordinate theme was that kind of human connection and that the reduction of human connection. I think the energy definitely has changed in the workplace. Mm, there is just not much fun anymore. It's because it's, it's just more serious now. I suppose people have COVID fatigue, you could call it. Because I suppose nothing else, you, you can't go anywhere, you've nowhere to let go, you can't go out for something to eat, to socialise. And then Jane says, it was sad, because when you're in Murray Mass, you cannot see the person's face, and this is a difficult one. Because usually you would smile at someone or a patient. It's very hard to say, I'm actually, to say I'm actually smiling at you, to give some support, because you can't see the face, all you can see is the eyes. And for others, there was an unexpected benefit. The one thing I found fantastic really was that people did come together. I mean, 
there could have been times beforehand when they would have been asked to do something and they didn't. They would have had their heels dug in. But I think people realise we're in this together in a major crisis. You know, we have a, we have to band together. There's a great support like that. So Mary, who was a manager, she was speaking about her team. And for others, there was a sense of resentment and kind of an atmosphere. So for Claire, she was kind of speaking about when she got back from work and what was happening with neighbours. We were just like struggling and friends would say, oh, you know, you guys have got work. It's great to get out to work, stuff like that. But I know she was out jogging every day with her friends, having coffee outside. She had people around for dinner, four families for dinner, and then 12 boys in the back and the garden. And I remember thinking, this is a punch in the face. After what we had been through and what the hospital has been through, we were trying to pull down the numbers. And fear was, was a major subordinate theme here. Fear for oneself. And in particular, those who had an underlying condition. So for Jenny is, I had a bizarre experience of COVID mm, because I have asthma and it was kind of a worry when it all started because you were seeing these awful media pictures, people on ventilators and stuff. For Colm, it was, I voiced my opinion about what I have. And that was not necessarily a knockback, but it was definitely dismissed in a fairly quick conversation. I took that as okay as well as I just have said it, that's it. Fear for one's family. Every day going in, you wonder if this is the day I'm going to get sick. You, you know, is this the day? Is this the day I'm going to bring it back to my partner? And another subordinate theme was the management within the hospital. For Jenny, she felt it was, you know, that kind of sub theme of poor communication. At the very beginning, I felt like we were getting very little information. In-house gossip was what was happening. And for others, they felt su support, some support and some not support. So for Claire, it was a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more kind of adaptability to different people's circumstances, a bit more support from the government and the HSE. And for Leah, she felt it was actually even good to, to have the interview uh, with myself. It was good to talk about what has happened in the work because I haven't really spoken to anyone about it. The full story, if that makes sense, telling the story, getting it off my chest. And for others, control was important. So Mary says, I found it a good experience just to be there for people to, to be kind of a, a rallying point, being able to provide information. For James, it was like, I, I like the idea of being available to people, being visible, people being able to confide in me, people being able to help, been able to help them out to understand their points of view. And for Brenda, it was, you're kind of playing a role as such. It was, mm, it was like kind of a purpose. Therefore, it is OK to take on these additional pieces, for want of a better word. So it was like I had a purpose in this. And then an, another theme was the impact, another subordinate theme was the impact of cancer and imp impact of ca on cancer. So COVID and cancer, obviously, was it, working in uh, St. Luke's was a major part. So it was, it was quite concerning the, the lack of patients that we're seeing, new patients. And yet there's no reason to assume that the incidence of cancer has dropped but there is a decrease in people coming forward. And I can't say for sure that we are seeing patients with more advanced stages, but it's impossible to think that we're not because people aren't going for screening. And moral injury was something that kind of came up again and again. And so I guess moral injury is when um, the workplace circumstances clash with one's own moral compass or um, ethical code causing distress for staff. So for Emma, I was, I was really conscious that patients weren't getting the same level of care as pre-pandemic because we weren't sitting chatting with them for ages. So I was conscious that from a patient's perspective, you weren't doing as good a job initially and you that 
you would have done pre-pandemic and that would have frustrated a lot of people. Impact on the family. The choice was upon me. Being not with my family, not with my kids. And I remember thinking, I'm here with patients who probably don't need me as much as my children do. We were just kind of clutching at straws. We have no, we had no family, none of my family are around. And again, we can kind of see that moral injury, you know, that kind of been pulled between wanting to kind of look after patients and, and obviously wanting to look after their own children. So kind of a kind of a moral pull as such. And financial impact, you know, Claire spoke about the lack of support, financial cost of paying for childcare up until the cost, up and up until the kids have gone back to school now. It was crazy. It was like 450 per week. So I had been paying to go to work. It actually worked out that we had to pay to go to work. And then the final subordinate theme was personal reflections. And so many staff members, you know, kind of paused and kind of thought about, you know, the impact on COVID on their work. It makes me think about the future a lot, how important work is for quality of life. It was and how it was it was me thinking, should I sell up, move somewhere, work from home? I think more about quality of life when some sort of normality comes back and what what is really important. It was a sense of gratitude, more time spent at home and you can't go anywhere. You end up spending more time. You actually appreciate like, I don't know, artistic stuff, cooking, talking to friends on the phone. And then workplace in the future, I'm definitely going to use virtual clinics much more frequently, much more now. So kind of to sum up, I think many of the things that kind of came across and many of the, the subordinate themes were fear and worry and worry and fear and worries that were ameliorated for those who had or were given a purpose. And a feeling a feeling out of of control over their own role within the landscape that felt out of control for them and for others who perceived not to be given a sense of flexibility or autonomy distress worsened. The pandemic was a time for reflection on what it's like to work with cancer patients and what keeps staff in, the, in work, you know, patient and colleague relationships and how these workplace values came to the fore when it was taken away. Participants reported that restrictions enforced a slower pace of life, a different way of working, you know, telehealth and conference calls and so on, and overall indicating that these pauses and changes were welcomed. So I just kind of want to mention a little bit about challenges, the challenges of this particular piece of research um, and then I mentioned a little bit about challenges of kind of doing research generally. Um, so, you know, doing research when you have a full clinical load, it's difficult. Um, a lot of the, you know, sometimes you're doing it in your own time. Um, so I guess it's having a passion for it and, and, and really um, feeling that it may make a difference or feeling that there's a need to capture something. Um, so that was a challenge. And I think for me, um, what helped me within that is that I work with a team of psychologists who are equally passionate about research. Um, and I think as psychologists, uh, we, it's it's a major part of our training uh, and, and our discipline. So it, everyone was on board and everyone was willing to kind of give that commitment. Um, and we kind of divvied up the work as well. And so for this particular research, um, I was aware that uh, there was kind of a qualitative uh, piece of research done on, on COVID and the impact on COVID on uh, by uh, other psychologists in the general hospitals in Dublin. Um, and but overall, generally, there's a real pull to kind of qualitative, you know, uh, research. If you can't measure it, then it doesn't exist. So that was a challenge, but we really felt strongly that within this particular research, it was important that it was qualitative to capture the rich, nuanced um, experience of staff that would have been missed if, if it was qualitative, quantitative. 
Um, ethical approval is a tricky one because ethical approval within hospitals and ethics board, they take up a lot of time. Um, and, and so I had to do a shortened ethical um, submission because it was kind of seen as a service development piece. Um, so that's something to kind of note if you are doing some research. Can you um, skip the, the major kind of ethical approval because it might be a service development piece? And maybe that's something that you connect with your, your research boards about. Um, dissemination um, is, is a challenge when you're, you're kind of when you're working full time and kind of getting it out there. Um, but having the support, I, I think, of um, you know, the the knowledge translation was really, really helpful. The team um, presenting here today um, and kind of back to my original point, time, 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 having time when you're, you're predominantly clinical um, that it's, it's, it's tricky. I think overall as kind of a moving aside from this particular research, how I um, ensure that research is a part of my role and my my job is that what I do is I, I link with universities and we always have a doctor trainee um, and a PhD trainee so I, I link in with different universities with that because they can do the literature review and I can kind of support them on site uh, with the kind of practical piece um, we, I, I link with Trinity College a lot and I've done, um, I'm on a, two different kind of research um, programs with them, which is supported by the HRB um, and they would have kind of initiated that kind of grant process and just having the support of people whose jobs are dedicated to research um, is really, really helpful. Um, and also kind of linking in with um, the Irish Cancer Society from a cancer support uh, perspective, uh, they're really, really supportive. And so whichever kind of clinical program that you could be aligned to, they may be able to help you or the charities involved. Um, so just a last word here in terms of research dissemination for this particular study, um, participants were given re the research in advance um, to ensure that they, they thought it was uh, all anonymous and just wanted to check with them because people really disclosed a lot. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I, I contacted HSE Knowledge Translation, who were really, really helpful, uh, presented this particular research to the Executive Management Board in St. Luke's Hospital, um, and they were really uh, receptive to that and they had great questions around that. It was also then emailed to all staff and a, a presentation was offered to all staff as well. Um, a copy was given to um, the National um, Cancer Control Program, the NCCP, because that's in terms of cancer care, that's our national uh, clinical program. Uh, kind of also given to the, the, the bigger kind of Dublin hospitals that I kind of mentioned, they're doing a, a larger study. Um, it was fed into kind of a nursing initiative that we have. Um, to support nurses and that was fed into that and the findings um, were kind of kind of went 360 degrees in terms of helping nurses and being able to kind of uh, have a kind of bespoke program for them. It would be presented at the Psychological Society of Ireland conference and um, it's submitted for publication and uh, today the webinar today. Um, okay that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie.